Amy Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games, and this is my weekly live cast in which I share Stonemeyer Games news, answer your questions on Facebook, and then later on when I post this video on YouTube, and, uh, and just discuss random topics, things going on with me. To start off with one of those random topics, uh, Megan and I subscribed to something called Universal Yums, which is a, a monthly treat box from a different country. So every, every month we get treats from a different country. And so my chocolate of the day this today is this. Uh, it's kind of like a cookies and cream candy from Colombia. We had a Colombian box uh, maybe a, a weekend or so ago, and we like these so much that we ordered them. Because if you like something from Universal Yums, you can just order more of it if they still have it in stock. They're really good if you like cookies and cream. I like these a lot. These are treats from Colombia, and that will be my chocolate of the day today. I also, uh, well, I have a question right away. Let me mention one other thing because I don't want to forget this. Um, Lane at Meeple's Crossing, here's Meeple's Crossing if you want to check this out, sent me this awesome shirt, this Wingspan shirt, um, because Stonemaier Games, we let people, third-party accessory creators, make cool stuff for our games, or cool stuff related to our games, as long as they don't pretend that it's an official Stonemaier product, or if they make it clear that it's not an official Stonemaier product. And so Lane did that with Wingspan and made this awesome shirt. It says, the early bird gets whatever it wants. And it's really comfortable, it's Bella Canvas material, and uh, I love the design of it. I, I love I love t-shirts and game-related uh, apparel that doesn't scream, this is about a board game, but rather just looks good and is a clever nod or a wink to those who know that it is about a board game. So thank you so much to Lane at Meeple's Crossing um, up in Canada for, for making this and sharing it with me. And he also made shirts for, for Joe and Alex for whom or with whom I will be having a play test today and I'll share the shirts with them when we play test. Um, let's see, Alex over here says, do you have any plans for Charterstone? Uh, I don't, no, I don't have any other plans for Charterstone. No, it's, uh, it's kind of a self-contained thing, and I'm glad that it has even more life now that the digital version is out. Um, but, uh, but thank you, Alex, for your very kind comment. I'm glad you enjoy Charterstone. Um... I had one other related. Oh yeah, I'm doing a playtest today, and I think I can say what it's about. I don't always say what we're playtesting, but uh, I have revealed that we are working on a viticulture expansion, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what it's about, how it works, or anything like that. But we are playtesting that today in my home office here with masks on. We'll be careful, um, but we're going to play the the cooperative expansion um, for for viticulture that I've mentioned. Um, we're not cooperative, I'm sorry, just the expansion for Viticulture that I mentioned. Uh, the cooperative game is the open world game that I'm working on, and that one I'm actually working on today a little bit, um, just uh, working on some, some game design stuff. And I'm also working on, I've, I've had a lot of time to work on game design for another game that, uh, that I'm excited about. Lots of, lots of design work lately, I've, I've had some, some time for that, so I, I always enjoy when I have a little bit of time to work on game design. Ash says, are there any plans for the digital wingspan for Switch or iOS? The digital wingspan. Oh, there are. Yes, uh, that is something that the developer Monster Couch is working on. Um, for all of our digital games, they are uh, licensed to digital developers, and they run the show from there. So uh, I know that Monster Couch is working on an iOS and Android version. They are also working on a Switch version of Wingspan. I think the Switch version is due to come out first, and then the iOS Android version. Betsy says, at what point do you start prototyping and initial playtesting? I'm finding it daunting and difficult to move on from the brainstorming phase. I can definitely relate to that, Betsy, but partially because I love the brainstorming phase. That's one of my favorite parts of designing a game, because anything's possible then when you're brainstorming. But uh, at a certain point, I just say, you know, as cool as this game sounds on paper, I need to actually do something with it and see how it actually works. And so I kind of just cut myself off at a certain point and say, okay, I kind of give myself permission to continue to explore it, but, but still get something to the table. So maybe today's the day, Betsy, if, if you are feeling that way about brainstorming, maybe today's the day to say, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is make a prototype and I can always go back to brainstorming afterward. You're going to have to go back to brainstorming afterward because the first prototype is not going to function the way that you hope it will. Uh, so make today that day. Uh, today is the day that you, you start prototyping um, and just get that first prototype at the table and you can always go back to brainstorming afterwards. Tim says, um, uh, Tim, Tim is just saying he's looking forward, well, he has a longer comment here, but he's saying he just ordered Charter, Charterstone the other day, and he's looking forward to pre-ordering the Wingspan Oceania expansion um, next week. Uh, and that's awesome. Thank you, Tim. And yeah, that is a nice little reminder here that Wingspan Oceania 
will uh, the pre-order will be next week, next Wednesday at this time. That's when we send out our monthly e-newsletter. And uh, soon after that, we will start shipping. I think this will be a pretty big ship out, especially in the U.S. And so it's going to take a while to ship out all the orders. We'll start with champion orders first, Domar Champion. Um, and then we'll get to uh, all the other orders. So it, it might carry over into, into December. It's going to be a long ship out, but we will start shipping out almost right away after that pre-order. Also, for those of you wondering about Oceania reviews, um, I don't see any links that have gone live yet. I, I checked on YouTube before this video, but I know that today is the day when reviewers can launch and reveal their reviews for Wingspan Oceania, the advanced copy reviewers. So um, you will see those. I will consolidate them on the Wingspan Facebook group and on the Wingspan Oceania page on our website. So I'm excited to, well, I won't be watching the reviews, but I'm excited to share them with you so you can see what, uh, what unbiased people think about this expansion that I am so excited about. What else is going on today? I my sticky note on the screen there. Um, Kevin says, what is the most interesting game that you've played recently and why? Uh, what is the most interesting game? Well, you know, I, I, I play a lot of games, but... Um, one that I played very recently is I, I tried out the new Magic the Gathering set called Zendikar Rising. I played a draft of that over the weekend. I usually try to play one draft of, of Magic whenever a new set comes out so I can learn from it. And uh, my, I'm going to do, I have a favorite mechanism video coming out about it, but I will spoil that a little bit and say that I really love the double-sided cards in this set where one side is a spell and the other side is a land. And uh, that just adds a whole new element to magic in the way that you can construct your deck uh, in limited or in constructed. So yeah, that, that's my, you'll see a video about that in a, in a few weeks, maybe next week, I think. Adrian says, uh, he says, uh, how can I ask you for friendly prototype testing? Um, thank you for asking about that, Adrian, but my sole focus is on stuff that Stomayar Games makes. I do play a lot of other games from other publishers, so I can learn from that experience, but I don't I don't want to say I don't make I don't have time, but I, I would say I don't make time because my focus is on Stonemaier games. So I am not available to play test for you. But I appreciate you asking about that. Um, what else is going on right now? We are kind of ramping up and preparing for the Wingspan Oceania pre-order, prepping our fulfillment centers, checking in with freight shipping companies. So far, the freight shipments seem largely on schedule. They're not going to arrive right in time for the October twenty eighth pre-order for Wingspan Oceania, but they should arrive the next week in uh, US, Canada, UK, and Australia. Um, I don't think much else is going on there. There's a lot of prep that goes into getting that pre-order ready, like getting the, the Shopify page ready for it and stuff like that. But I, I think we're, we're pretty much, we're close to being prepped for that. Um, what else is going on here? Uh, yeah, I mentioned that I'm working on a few game designs right now. I did my video this past week about games that are really easy to set up and some of the nice things about having games that are really easy to set up uh, being that they often get to the table more often because you don't have to spend a lot of time setting them up. They often end up being games that are easy to teach too. Um, so I had, that was my video this past week about games that are really easy to set up and games that you don't even have to ever refer to the rule book to figure out player scaling or things like that. You just put it out on the table and start playing. Um, yeah, let me jump over to questions. I'll jump back over to some of my random topics here. Uh, Mitchell says, any idea when expansions will be available for the Scythe mobile app? Um, hope you enjoyed my Polania pumpkin. Oh, yeah, that was your, oh, yeah, that was really awesome, Mitchell. A, a very impressive pumpkin carving. Um, I don't know. Uh, that, that's totally up to Asmodee Digital and the Knights of Unity. They're the ones that have the digital license for Scythe. So uh, I hope it will be soon, but I, 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 I really don't know. Um... Let's see. Uh, Tim says, how did your... Oh, Tim has a question that's referring to uh, uh, a champion. So I don't want to address that here, Tim. I appreciate you asking about that. But um, uh, that's something that I will write a blog entry about pretty soon. About uh, We did a, a little sale for our Stillmeyer champions recently. So I'll, I'll do a blog post about that probably tomorrow, actually. Uh, but actually, part of this thing that I'll, I will mention in relation to Tim's question is that one of the things that we're testing is offering U.S. customers, starting with U.S. customers, we might expand this, but U.S. customers, the option at checkout to choose instead of the regular shipping option, which is uh, FedEx SmartPost, which is when FedEx 
initiates the the shipping, the, the fulfillment, but then they hand it off to USPS for, for final delivery. We're offering, we're testing the idea of offering customers uh, FedEx home delivery, which costs a little bit more for you. At checkout, you can choose that. You have to pay a little extra. But some people really prefer FedEx home to SmartPost. Um, SmartPost works well for a lot of people, but also some people have a very bad experience with it, uh, whereas home is can be much better for some people. So we're testing that out in our system. It's more complicated than us just like adding it. It, it required an extra app that we had to add to our system. We have to sync it with our fulfillment system. And we want to see how it actually works out. So we're kind of testing that right now to see how the, the logistics of it actually work out. Um, and we're testing that this week. And if it works out, we will probably keep that for the Oceania pre-order. But we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Um, Eric says, you hear about Pluto. That's messed up, right? Uh, I, 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 I mean, I heard years ago that Pluto was no longer a, a determined to be a planet, but I didn't know there was fresh news about Pluto. What's the, what's the fresh news about Pluto here, Eric, that you're referring to? Ilya says, would it make sense for you, for you to consider using Amazon fulfillment for cheaper international shipping? Um, Ilya, actually, you can look at, our, at my blog. I have several entries about this. I used to use Amazon fulfillment. Um, Amazon multi-channel fulfillment, and it was really bad uh, for a multiple multiple reasons. Uh, a few of the big ones that I'll mention is that the customer service is really bad. Like it's really tough to just get in touch with an individual person and and find out information or fix something that went wrong. Really, really difficult. Um, the other thing is it's really difficult to set up on an ongoing basis. Every time you want to put a new product in, it's really complicated. If you enter one thing like slightly incorrectly, it messes up everything. Um, so I much, much prefer to work with the fulfillment centers that we work with. Oh, and the other thing about Amazon too is their, their philosophy somewhat is that the packaging of your product um, should be enough to prevent the product from breaking and shipping. Which is great if I order like, you know, a, 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 like the, I ordered this candy from Universal Yums. This is fine if it's shipped without any padding. It's going to arrive just fine. Uh, but a board game, you don't want it to arrive dented. And Amazon has had many, many cases where board games arrive with really poor packaging because they consider the packaging for the game to be the game box. Whereas as a gamer, you know, it's a little disappointing when you get a game box that's dented at the corner or like ripped up the side. Whereas uh, and you can return that to Amazon, but uh, it's not ideal when that happens. So I'll try to keep this answer short, but I have tried it and I was really not happy with it. So I much prefer to work with our, um, our the fulfillment centers that we work with, which are Aetherworks in Australia, Greater Than Games in the US, D6 in Canada, and Spiral Galaxy in the UK and the EU. Chad says his wife and I his wife and him just bought Charterstone. Is there a recommended player count? Also, do you have a favorite starting area or character? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I play red, and so I played the red character, but um, I tried to not let that influence the design of the red charter or the red character in the game. So uh, I would go just go with your favorite, your preferred color in any game. Recommended player count? I designed it to work as well, to be fun and functional at two to six players. So... Um, I would, I would say the key answer to that question for Charterstone is that you are asking players to commit to 12 games. It's a 12-game campaign. And so I would recommend finding people that enjoy legacy games, that, want, that enjoy worker placement games, and genuinely want to be a part of that experience for 12 games. Uh, you could, if you had six people, if you had, I don't know, it, it, I would say it's it aim for the, the type of people, not the number of people, because I did design it to work what I think really well at, between two and six players. Maxime says, for Wingspan, will we have additional Nectar Birds in the future expansions? So the percentage of these birds stay the same if we shuffle all cards and use the, ne the Nectar Mat. Probably not, Maxime, because one of the design philosophies we have for all of our expansions is that you never need to buy one expansion. Um, if you buy one expansion, you don't need to buy any of the other expansions. And so if we did that for Nectar, then you would need to by Oceania because of the mats that come with, with this. And you need those mats to play with the 17 nectar birds in the expansion. So those will most likely be the only nectar birds that we include. It is possible because this is a cool mechanism and nectar does exist in other parts of the world other than just Oceania. Um, it is possible we will include some cards in a future expansion that we will just say you can only use these if you have Oceania. But we, I doubt it. We'll see how that works out. But I, 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 that, that is slightly possible, but I would never want an entire other expansion to rely on another expansion. 
Um, I did a few blog posts recently, as always. One was about, uh, earlier this week, was about um, your voice mattering, whether you're expressing it as a backer or a customer or as an employee or a boss. Um, and if you are in that position of authority or if you're a creator, um, helping people feel like their voice matters, whether or not you agree with them, whether or not you act on it, but that, that you help them feel that way and that you, if you are asking for feedback, that you are genuinely open to acting on it if you end up agreeing with that feedback. So I had a blog post about that. And also on Thursday last week, I did a blog post that I wasn't really planning on, but I was listening to uh, The Covenant Cast, uh, a great podcast where Rodney Smith from Watch It Played appeared on this on this podcast. And he had like all, the, all these fantastic nuggets of wisdom that really resonated with me. So I shared four of my favorites on last Thursday's blog post. So if you like Rodney, if you like nuggets of wisdom, feel free to check out that blog post last week. I also had some great chats this week. One was a podcast interview with uh, Renato from down in Brazil. We had a, a great chat about Stillmire Games and gaming in Brazil. And I had a fun chat yesterday with uh, Marcin at GameFound. So GameFound is the company that is currently a pledge manager, but they are turning that pledge manager platform into also a crowdfunding platform. So it will be both all tied into one, kind of like Kickstarter, but built around uh, board games. And so we had a fun chat. Marston also runs Awaken Realms, which is a, a company that I really, really admire. Um, so we had a fun chat. I'd never gotten to talk with him before, so it was nice to connect with another um, person who runs a game company. Jake says, did I check out the Kickstarter for the U.S. printing of Big Monster? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was one of the first backers of it. Um, uh, and you're right. Yeah, it is it currently, and just full disclaimer, some friends of mine are running this campaign. Um, I'm also bummed that it is currently not on track to fund, but uh, hopefully they can learn from it and go back and launch it because it has a really, really cool drafting mechanism. And I'm glad, Jake, that you posted the link here. John says, what was the best gaming experience that you had recently? Well, you know, I mentioned the, the Magic Zendikar Rising draft that I did online this past weekend. I didn't mention that it was online. It was an online draft. And I had a lot of fun with it. I, I, I'm really excited about that. Um, and to tie off that, to, to kind of pigeon tail off that, um, I, I was looking at games. People asked last week, what Essen releases, Essen Spiel releases am I excited about? And I found one that I had no idea that was coming out because I love tug of war games. And there's a game called Royal Visit, I believe designed by Reiner Knizia. Let's see. Yes, it is. And it's apparently kind of a new version of an older game, but it is a, a really cool looking tug of war game in the style of Watergate, if you played that, where uh, you're kind of tugging a few different components back and forth between you and another player, two player game. So I'm really excited about that. I, I had no idea that was coming out. And I have already pre-ordered it because I, I want to get my hands on that. So I'm curious if any of you have watched any videos or learned about any Essence Spiel releases and which of those are you the most excited about. Dan King at the Game Boy Geek had a, a great video, I think yesterday, about the top 10 games that he's most excited about that he hasn't played coming out at, at Essence Spiel and uh, the top 10 that he has played that he's also still excited about. Uh, Martin says, wanted to th say thanks for the back backer kit chat last week. Yes, yeah, Martin, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Last week I had a fun chat with Jason at Backer Kit just about uh, Backer Kit and Stillmire Games and, and, and gaming and game design, a lot about game design, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so that was a, a fun chat to have over, over with the Backer Kit folks. And Martin, I appreciate you connecting me with, with Jason. Lewis says, I would love to know how difficult it is to have such an active relationship with your customers during all the work you do. I've noticed that you are the best in the field with close relations, and I assume all the work you do takes up a lot of time. Lewis, is very kind of you to say that. I, I think I'm far from the best in the field at, at doing that, um, but it's nice that you perceive it that way, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I have learned, I think, to make a designated time for for this kind of thing, this kind of, kind of chat. So like this could get out of control. If I did Facebook Lives every day for three hours a day, I would never get any other work done or I would get some done, but it would be, I would have a lot of time pressure. But I, I decided to do it once a week. Once a week seemed like a, a sweet spot for doing a Facebook Live video. And I love doing this. I love connecting with, with people like you in real time. Um, I do make time to go on Board Game Geek and our various Facebook groups. But one thing that has really helped is, uh, and I answer emails if anyone emails me, 
But one thing that has really helped is adding Joe as our director of operations or director of communications here at Stonemaier Games. So Joe now does a lot of that communication. He fields questions that come through on our contact email on our um, on our Stonemaier Games. If you contact us through the Stonemaier Games Facebook page, he's active in a lot of the Facebook groups. So that has been really helpful for me. I, I did that for years and, and was there to answer rules questions and, and questions like that. And now I, may, I mainly just chime in if, um, if people post a question on one of my social media feeds, like on, on YouTube, on Instagram, things like that, or if uh, someone tags me on social media, namely on Facebook, um, to, to tag me because they want a specific answer from me. And then I, then I typically chime in. So I just, I, I designate some time for it and, um, and I designate certain types of questions and, and topics that I chime in on. And I trust Joe to do a great job with everything else. So that's how I found balance with it. Mariana says, have I backed any board games on Kickstarter lately? I have. Let's see what I backed most recently. Um, I'll pull up my recently backed here. While I'm doing that, let's see if I have any other topics. Oh, I've been, I've, I might have mentioned this last week, but I've gotten back into, or I've ex started experimenting again with, uh, with indoor rock climbing. So I got really into indoor rock climbing before the pandemic and then didn't feel safe doing it. But I have started going back to the gym uh, with a mask on and during weird hours when not many people are there. And I've been having a lot of fun with it. So I'm glad I've gotten back into that. And uh, I'm curious if any of you have, have, had to give up a hobby during that pandemic, but you've been able to find a safe way to rekindle that hobby um, now. And for many of that might be board gaming, which is one of the things that I really miss. I've been doing most of that digitally and online. I miss in-person gaming quite a bit. So things I backed recently, Big Monster, which was mentioned earlier, uh, Fantastic Factories Manufactions, that's uh, the expansion to Fantastic Fa Factories. Blabble, which is a fascinating looking cooperative game where each player has a different language that they are trying to use to communicate concepts to other players. And Cartographer's Heroes plus the three map pack expansions. Um, I haven't backed for everything on that expansion, but I did back for, for some of the things there. Uh, those are all the active campaigns that I've backed recently. I believe those are still active. Yeah, those are active. And I think most of them have funded, some of them have well overfunded, except for Big Monster. So it doesn't look like, unfortunately, that it, that it is going to fund. Only th 33 hours left, unfortunately. But um, still worth checking out. If you check it out, you can at least then offer some feedback to them about ways that they can possibly improve in the future. Let's see if I have any other topics. So other games that I played last week. I won a game. Did I win at Clans of Caledonia? Megan, did I win Clans? Okay, maybe, maybe. Uh, I think I did. I don't even remember. But I played Marco Polo two. And I did. Okay, yeah. <laughs> played Clans Online last week, a four-player game, and maybe I won. I, we think I did. And I played Marco Polo two on Board Game Arena as well, and had fun with both of them. Th those are like my my style of of games, my my Euro style games that I really enjoy to play. Uh, David says, given the theme, did I ship more copies of the Oceania expansion to Australia than you did the European one? We did, yeah. Um, we shipped a lot more to distributors in Australia and New Zealand than normal, but we also shipped more for direct orders as well. Liz says, what time on Wednesday will the Oceania pre-order start? Uh, usually I aim for around 9.30 a.m. Central Time. Um, that's, I'm saying I aim for that because things can come up that can change that a little bit, but that's typically what I aim for. Uh, by 10 o'clock at the latest, it should be live. <laughs> Stefan has a fun random question. What's your favorite Tim Curry role? His is Long John Silver and Muppet Treasure Island, though Clue is close. Ooh, those are both really good picks. Um, let me Google to see if I'm forgetting any roles here. Tim Curry was like the quintessential villain in movies in, in the 90s, and those are two great roles from him. Tim Curry movies. Let's see what I'm forgetting. Oh, apparently he was in the original It, which I have not seen. He was in Home Alone 2. I don't remember him in Home Alone 2. Muppet Treasure Island, Annie, The Three Musketeers, Fern Gully. Charlie, the original Charlie's Angels. I don't remember him in that one either. Congo? He was in, he was in like everything in, in the 90s. Um, I'll probably go with Muppet Treasure Island. I think he did a really good job in that role. 
That's what Megan got me to watch like half of the Muppet movies last year. I'd seen a few of them, but not all of them. They're actually quite good. Zach says, is there a reason that several of the tapestry landmarks have a white-gray color scheme? It seems like they are mainly the final landmarks in each track, so I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be a consistent futuristic look. And that is exactly correct, Zach. Yeah, that was what the sculptor was going for, to have the different materials that are used um, thematically in each building, to uh, have them reflect uh, what, uh, what kind of age they would be, be able to be built in. And so that's, this is kind of a futuristic look for the buildings. And I have something I kind of want to say here. Let me see if, uh, no, I can't say it yet. There's something that I want to say about Tapestry, but it's probably a little bit too early to reveal. Something I'm really excited about, but uh, I don't want to say it quite yet. But yeah, thank you for asking about that, Zach. Um, Pablo says, any recommendations to a designer that will release his or her first game on Kickstarter for the first time? Um, well, Pablo, hopefully you've read through my Kickstarter lessons blog. It's there to help new creators and experienced creators alike. Uh, so hopefully you've done that. That's my big recommendation. But if you've already done that, I'm almost assuming that if you're here, you have done that. That uh, you said, is there anything that, that I can say to help calm you down a little bit as you get ready for it? And, um, you know, this is the time to maybe not be calm. Uh, and to obsess over every little detail on the page, especially the things that you can't change after the project goes live. You can change the text on the project page. You can change the the uh, the, the images there. But once people start backing those reward levels, you can't change the wording on them. You can't change the prices, stuff like that. So, uh, and the shipping. So I would highly recommend that this is the time to really obsess over those details and to get other people to look at your project page and to preview it and uh, give you feedback about those things while you still can change them. Yeah, that's, that's my advice. James says, as a Brit, I'm curious why you used uh, pounds for Lyra in Viticulture. Uh, uh, that's a good question. I, I, th I think we found that that was the old symbol for Lyra, but it's been a long time since we chose that, so I don't remember, James. But that might, might be an old symbol for Lyra. Andrew said, where do you get your shirt? I said this early on in the podcast or the broadcast, but there are more people here. So this is something that Lane at Meeple Crossing sent to me. It is a wingspan shirt that says the early bird gets whatever it wants. And I love kind of the, the vintage design look of this shirt. Uh, love it. And it feels really good. It's bell canvas, my favorite material to make a shirt out of. Um, if you want one, you can go to Meeple Crossing and get one. Especially if you're in Canada, because I think Meeple Crossing is based in Canada. I don't know if they ship elsewhere yet other than this special shipment that Lane sent to me. Oliver says, your board games are famous for great components. Why don't you br uh, bring inlays into your games? It's important for many players. Inlays. Uh, I'm guessing, well, Oliver, I would love some more specificity on that. Uh, for example, I, the, the example I can think of is for Pendulum. That's uh, one example where, uh, I think that's what you're talking about. Well, no, that's an overlay. Oliver, I'd like to hear more about what you're saying, what an inlay is. And the answer is possibly that I haven't thought of it, or maybe it's that uh, it would make the cost of the game way too much and increase the price to the, the consumer. But I'd love to see specifically what you're thinking about. Is there a specific game where you would like an inlay for it? Lewis says, one of the biggest things I've noticed about Stomar Games is the amazing customer support and replacing lost parts or broken parts, anything that's missing or broken in your game. Yeah. How much does this affect the cost of running your business? if it's what mo most people love you for, but does it take a toll? Uh, Lewis, I would not say it takes a toll for me because I have delegated this to other people um, and it takes a significant amount of resources. Uh, we have millions of copies of games in print at this point and we get, off the top of my head, I'm guessing around 10, at least 10,000. No, I don't want to be too high. I don't want to guess off the top of my head, but in the thousands for sure, thousands of replacement, car, pro, replacement parts request every year from different regions around the world. It is a big part of Joe's job, and we also have helpers in the UK, Mark's in the UK, we have Devin in Canada, Helen in Australia, um, who do we have, um, um, I shouldn't be forgetting this, but we do have someone in Japan, people around the world who uh, have essentially volunteered their time to send out replacement parts to people who request them. And we compensate them in any way we can, but most of them have actually refused, refused payment. We just send them free games and free stuff and a little bonus at the end of the year. But uh, 
the cost of all the, the mailing of those parts and the time it takes is substantial. Um, I would say probably around thirty to forty thousand dollars a year in 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 all associated cost with replacement parts. However, like you said, it's I think it's important uh, that we that we maintain that level of quality and trust with customer service when people are missing a part that we replace it or if something is broken that we replace it. There are very few rare exceptions when we don't do it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it is pretty important to us. Adrian says, I'm curious, what has sold more copies, Wingspan or Scythe? What do you account for the difference? Uh, the core games, if we're comparing the core games, Wingspan has, has now outsold Scythe. Um, in terms of all ancillary products, expansions, accessories, accessories, all that stuff, uh, Scythe has sold way more copies than Wingspan at this point. Um, as for the difference, I don't know. They're very different games. Uh, I think they some they do probably appeal to the, some of the same people because they are both engine building games, but they're very different thematically. Their price points are very different. Scythe is a ninety dollars price point, wingspan sixty dollars. A Scythe has been around for longer, hence this more products related to it, more sales for all of those products. Um, wingspan has reached a a, a non gaming community, non gamers like birders um, that uh, that we didn't reach with Scythe. Uh, so I think Scythe has appealed to some people thanks to the art, but uh, it's mostly a game for, for hobby gamers. So I think that's why Wingspan Core Game is sold, outsold Scythe at this point. Chance says, looks like the crappy weather here in St. Louis has at least one upside. The lighting for your video looks great today. Oh, thanks Chance, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, when I have, uh, when it's too bright out, it can it can get a little weird. I can adjust the, like I have a, a light on my camera itself that I can adjust when needed, but I, the lighting on Facebook is actually pretty good, so I usually don't turn that on. I hope you're doing well, Chance. Let's see. Um, I don't think I have any other specific topics, so I'll just mostly focus on questions now. Okay, Tim says, let's see, is this a question? No, not a question from Tim. I'm just scrolling through looking for questions here. Some people are talking about Charterstone and Wingspan. Uh, Lewis has a very nice comment here. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, Belasco says, what's my opinion on the upcoming Kickstarter for Endless Winter Paleo Americans? You know, I am not, I, I feel like I've heard of that game, but I am not familiar with any aspect of it other than that. What, what, what are you excited about for that campaign or that, that game at Belasco? Pablo says, do I like deck builders? Which one do you consider the best? Uh, I do like deck building games and bag building games. I have a top 10 video about that. Maybe I can find it real quick since we're a little slower today on questions. I can probably find it. So um, I listed near the top. I know I listed Orleans, Quacks, and, um, and Clank. Love all those games. So two bag builders in there, one deck builder. And actually Clank has bag building and deck building with the Clank mechanism. Oh, there is actually a Wingspan Oceania review now. I went to YouTube to find this video. And Before You Play has their Oceania review up. So I will post that in the comments below. And, oh, i got to scroll down to post that. There's that video. And then I'll try to find the other video here about my favorite deck building games. Sorry about the, the dead air here. Uh, deck building. My top 10 favorite deck building games. Here we go. Ooh, very dark lighting in this video. But let's go ahead and post that. So this is my favorite, top 10 favorite deck building games. Okay. Nathan says, have I played any of the Sagrada expansions? I think I've only played the one that brings it up to like five or six players. I haven't played any, any of the other ones yet. He says, uh, yeah, he says he was a little disappointed to discover that the designer and publisher both have directly contradicting core rules interpretations from the expansions on Board Game Geek forums. You know, I can understand that dis disappointment. I have made that mistake myself. Usually it's a mistake when, because I'm the designer and the publisher, where I recall a rule incorrectly, things like that. Um, and sometimes Joe is there to chime in and say, you know, this is, this is right. Sometimes someone else chimes in and says, actually, Jamie, this is the right ruling. Or this is even the ruling that you made a year ago. So I think mistakes like that do happen. Um, but, uh, but I think that is tough when a designer and a publisher are disagreeing about something. They should probably get on the same page about it. 
Lewis says, what is your plan to fund future projects? Do I prefer Kickstarter, Patreon, Capital for previous sales? What is your best way to support? What is our best way to support your work? Thanks for asking about that, Lewis. Uh, we haven't used Kickstarter in years. We don't have any uh, plans to return to crowdfunding. Our current system is that um, we kind of actually fund the first printing of any new game from our existing revenue. And then the, we, we make it and then we have a pre-order for it. So for example, we've already made Wingspan Oceania. It's already on, uh, on freight shipments headed to fulfillment centers around the world. And some of those games will be able to, people can pre-order it next Wednesday and it'll be shipped for the most part over the course of November. And we also made a bunch of copies for distributors and retailers. Um, I would never say to not support a retailer that you really believe in and that you're passionate about. Um, so if, if, if that's the case for you, however, if you do want to best support Stillmeyer Games, um, it would be to sign up as a Stillmeyer champion and buy directly from us on an ongoing basis because our profit margin then is significantly higher and allows us to take, uh, take some more risks, I think, with, with interesting products that we wouldn't otherwise be able to make because, uh, because of selling directly. I mean, we, we just get a little bit more flexibility through those added profit margins when we sell directly. But uh, if there's another better way for you to buy one of our products, go for it. I, I don't want to hold you back from the, the way that is best for you. Let's see. Okay, Moe's confirms here. He says, I'm Italian. I, I can confirm that the symbol on the coins in Viticulture is the old symbol for Lyra. Okay, I remember that correctly. Thank you for clarifying that. Amanda says, our local convention is going virtual early next year, and we are looking at things that have worked well with other virtual board game conventions. What was the best new development you've seen in virtual conventions this year? Other people might have to chime in here because I haven't seen a lot. Um, but actually, the backer kit thing that happened last week, I'm not sure if that even really counts as a convention, but it seemed to go really well. I think they used StreamYard which didn't work for me on Chrome for some reason, but I got on it on my phone and it seemed to have really good engagement with people who were joining in the chat, asking questions. Um, and it was just kind of a conversation between me and Backerkit. I, no preparation required of me. I just showed up and had a nice conversation answering Jason's questions at Backerkit and answering the questions of participants. That isn't really a gaming thing, but it is, uh, I, I thought that streaming platform worked well for people to engage Kind of on the fly uh, with someone that maybe they wouldn't otherwise get to see if they can't join these Facebook live chats, things like that. So uh, that might be something to consider. I don't necessarily want to endorse StreamYard, but it did seem to work well for them. I'm pretty sure it was StreamYard that they used on Backerkit. Martin, if you're still watching, if you could confirm that, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> Jacob says, oh, Jacob has a nice comment here. Uh, he says, thank you for giving, I'm going to read it here because he has a, a promotion that I want to say out loud. He says, thank you for giving so much to the community. Your lessons help us, helped us before we launched this war of mine, the board game. And now I revisited your blog before we launched Frostpunk, the board game, which I love seeing that that is doing so well on Kickstarter. And um, if you follow Jakob, who the, the world builder and artist for Scythe, Jakob posted a special illustration that he made for this other Jakob, another Jakob, for Frostpunk on Instagram the other day. So if you go to Jakob Rosalski on Instagram, I think he's Mr. Werewolf there. You can see a really beautiful illustration in the Frostpunk world. So thank you, Jakob, for your very kind comment there. And uh, I, I love the support that, that Frostpunk has gotten so far. It looks like a, a beautiful game. Um, and I actually, I, I can relate to you going back to my blog and reading it, reading it as you prepare for the campaign. I go back to my own blog every now and then and read the comments and my posts to see like, what was I thinking back then? Or what, what, was, what, what was my thought process for this, uh, this uh, specific area? Um, not that I necessarily learn for myself, but I do like looking back on what I was thinking about certain, something at a, at a certain point in time. So I'm glad, it's good to hear that you, you did the same thing. Um, T Tanner has a comment. Can he, is he, oh, okay, I'll just read the whole thing here. He says, I hear a lot of people complaining about the quality of components in Pendulum. Personally, I really respect the compromises that you probably had to make to keep the price of the game low. Um, and that was kind of true. I mean, the, the in hindsight, I probably should have used wooden components for Pendulum. The primary reason I didn't was not cost. The cost would have been almost the same. The primary reason was uh, 
that uh, I was worried about fumigation laws in Australia that I misunderstood. I have a blog post about this. If you look on some of our games for wood versus plastic, I have a detailed blog about this. Um, so that was the main motivation there. Uh, and Tanner says, can you talk about why you might have pushed for the price point and the choices you had to make to make it happen? So the main thing with the price point, what, I don't know if you're referring to the wood and plastic, because I think that's what most people maybe are, have, have said they, they aren't happy about in Pendulum, the, the plastic components. Um, and I see that now. That, I think that was a mistake that I made, honestly. But we also included some comp components that cost more because I thought they would be nice. And one of them was the, uh, the frosting on the player mats. That is not a cheap thing to add to a player mat. Uh, and so I hope people acknowledge that and see that we could have just gone for an unfrosted player mat and it would have been, it would have been functional, but it wouldn't have felt nearly as nice as that frosting. Uh, but we chose to do that. We chose to have that extra expense. And in doing so, uh, that should have bumped the price of Pendulum up to $70, but I didn't want to go up to 70. I wanted it, I didn't want it to go any higher than 60. Um, so, I mean, that was the main thing that I, that I debated with Pendulum in terms of the cost. Everything else is, is, uh, like we, I, I did a, a metal component for the legendary achievement token. I could, that could have been plastic. Originally it was plastic, but it didn't feel legendary. So I went with metal that made it more expensive too. So in the end, I actually, the cost of Pendulum should justify a higher price than it currently is, but I didn't want to charge more than $60 for it, $60 MSRP. Yeah. Zach says, is that tapestry comment possibly going to be addressed in the next monthly newsletter? We'll see, we'll see. Uh, yes, I'll just say yes, yeah, it kind of will be. Andrew says, do I, find it difficult to, do, I, do I find it difficult to get people to play Scotland Yard? I always have a hard time getting to the table due to lack of interest from other players. You know, I don't, Andrew. I, I, um, I think people, maybe, maybe people just know in my group how much fun I have playing Scotland Yard, and so their game for it when, when I bring it to the table. But uh, yeah, people, I, I have not had a problem with that, at least in the back in the day when I could actually meet with people and play in person. Eric says, it would be great if Quebec champions could order French versions of your games, especially Wingspan and so on. I know Matigo is producing them, but maybe you could work out a deal with them. I appreciate you asking that, Eric. Our, our deal with Matigo is that they sell the French version of Wingspan and, and French version of our products, not Stillmeyer Games. However, Matigo does uh, sell in Canada, as uh, I think you are alluding to here. So um, I think if you want them to... Actually, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking because they do sell French versions of our games and expansions in Canada. So is there something else that you want them to do that they're not currently doing? Maybe um, I can encourage them to do that more or better or differently. Um, I, I love your feedback about that. But it will be something that Matigo handles, not somewhere games. Eric says, will there be a limit for how many copies of the Wingspan Oceana expansion can be pre-ordered? Um, that's a good question, Eric. I think we'll limit it to two per person. Um, yeah, I think that's the target here, to limit it to two per person. Because it, uh, we have an overall limit that we can even sell. Uh, and, and ship on a reasonable basis. So um, I think that's the target there. I need to probably add that to the wingspan, to the product listing though, because I don't think it's a limit of two per person or per order, really. Yeah, thanks for asking about that. That's a good reminder for the, the Shopify listing, actually. Calvin says, when I start designing games, when you approach it from the theme, are there some guiding questions that help you think about mechanisms? Um, that's a good question, Calvin. I mean, really the way that I work is if I have an idea for a theme or a mechanism for a new game, I sit down with paper and pencil and I write down that theme and I write down what's exciting about that theme or what's exciting about the mechanism. And then as soon as I have, we're talking about theme here, as soon as I have like a, a small groundwork for that theme, I start thinking about mechanisms that make sense for it. And they get added to the brainstorming tree on my, on my paper right away. Uh, so... I wouldn't say it's a gu the guiding questions or, or principles, but it's just a, a brainstorming process where I, I say, you know, right away, I want to start thinking about um, mechanical ways that, that could work for this theme, that makes sense for this theme. And that seems to work with, for me. So you could try that in, in your brainstorming process to sit down and put theme and mechanisms together on the same page almost right away. Don't spend too much time thinking about the theme without thinking about mechanisms and don't spend too much time thinking about mechanisms without thinking about the theme. James says, I know that you're a big fan of Terra Mystica. What advice would you give to a newbie? I mostly play it two player and so far he's 0 for 4. Some advice for you. Um, 
I mean, one thing that I usually tell for new to Terra Mystica players, but usually they're brand new, they haven't played four times like you, is to follow the uh, the guidance of the uh, the the round goals uh, to try to achieve as many of those goals or to get points off of as many of those goals as possible. Uh, I think that can kind of just be a nice guiding guiding light as you're playing uh, uh, Terra Mystica at the beginning the, for the first few times. Um, after that, it's more about the faction, I would say, to really uh, get your use those factions and maximize your use of the factions. Good luck in your next game with that, James. Jose says, how can someone uh, present or, 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 or submit a game to Stonemaier Games? He says, he's made a complete card game and I really want to present it to Stonemaier Games. Is that possible? It is possible. But uh, we are currently technically not open for submissions. However, if you go to the submissions page of our website, uh, you can see the guidelines to see if your game is even the type of game that we're looking for. And you can still submit it to us. It's just not something that we might review right away. Uh, currently, we review submissions, but on a pretty slow basis. And we're looking for things that really, really catch our eye. But yeah, the, the key way to do that for us or for any publisher is to go to their website and find their submission guidelines and to follow those guidelines. Looks like Miles has shared the Tantrum House review for Wingspan Oceania. That is now live as well. Thank you, Miles, for sharing that. We're going to see a few more reviews today, I'm sure. Russell says, have I had a chance to play On the Origin of Species yet? And no, I have not. No. Is that from Genius Games? Uh, also another company here in St. Louis. Oh, that's where, okay. Belasco clarified the game Endless Winter. I did see. I watched Rado do a playthrough of that the other day, and it looked pretty cool. I think it was Rado. I think that was on Rado's channel. Um, and I, I love the artwork from the Miko. It does look pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Tim says, what are my thoughts on Mysterium Park? He says, we watched a review of it. M Mysterium Park. Huh. I am not familiar. Is that based on the, the Mysterium IP? I'll have to look that up. I'll, I'll make a note of that, Tim. I, I've not heard of Mysterium Park, but I will check that out. John says, do I have a favorite game that received a revised edition? I, I can definitely think of games like Yado that I love that have received a revised edition, but I have not played the revised edition. Uh, Mansions of Madness, second edition. I really enjoy Mansions of Madness, second edition. I haven't played the first, but I, I know that I enjoy the second. Um... What else? So there's anything on my shelf. I think uh, QE actually is a game that I really enjoy, and I think that is based off of an older game. I don't know if it's technically a new edition of it or not. Um, let's see any other games on my shelf? Oh, Glenmore Two. That's another one. Glenmore Two. Really enjoy Glenmore Two. I would say, like I played the original Glenmore. I thought, okay, this is fine, but I love Glenmore Two. So yeah, I put that on there as well. That would be a fun list to do, like new. Uh, top 10 new editions or versions or versions of games. Yeah, so what did I mention? There? I mentioned Glenn Moore. I mentioned QE. Uh, I think that game from Knizia that I mentioned earlier is a new version of an older game. What was the other one that I just mentioned? Uh, oh, Mansion of Madness. Yeah. Can anyone else think of anything that you would add to that list? Like a new edition of an older game. Uh, whether it's, uh, oh, like all of Restoration games. That's kind of what Restoration does. Yeah. Alexis says, considering the pandemic has made it more difficult to play games physically, have I considered using Tabletop Simulator for testing your upcoming games? I have used it. Um, I don't like using it. Because it's, it just takes, it, it's a great platform, that and Tabletopia, fantastic platforms. But it takes so much longer to do like the simplest thing, like picking up a cube in real life, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to tell my hand to go pick up the cube. I just do it. And it just takes so much longer on Tabletop Simulator tabletop and Tabletopia. So I have done it, but I don't prefer to do it. I'd much rather get together with masks with a few people that I trust and play test and send out games to blind play testers around the world who can do the same thing safely. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Chance says, Jamie loves the technology tiles. I played with him a few... Oh, James, uh, Chance is talking about Terra Mystica. Um, and Chance is actually very, very good at Terra Mystica and very, very good at Gaia Project. 
He says, uh, his, I'll just read Chance's advice here for those of you who like Terry Mystic. He says, if I can help, definitely try to get technology tiles that work with your strategy early. Those are the oval tiles in the game. Um, then focus on maximizing points from the bonuses each round. Also, don't forget about the end game scoring bonuses. Yeah, I think that's that's a great tip. And Chance is definitely better at Terra Mystica than I am. So take his advice over mine. Skylar says, what are some of your favorite characters, factions to play to play as in various board games? What do I like about them? What is your process to create character storylines in your own games? That is a big, great question, but a very big question here, Skylar. Kind of tough off the top of my head to think of um, factions and or characters in just random games. Uh, let me, I, I, I'll pick one off my shelf here. Uh, the thing, actually, we're talking about Terra Mystica. I love, so... I play red. I usually play red in games. I try to play red whenever I can. In Terra Mystica, you don't really choose your, your color. You choose a faction. But I do love the... Um, I'm blanking on the name now. The Not the giants. It's on the other side of the red. They're, they're like... Uh, oh, Chaos. Chaos Magicians. I, I, I love them. Both because, both because they're, they're red and because they have an engine building aspect to them related to the tech tiles that Chance just mentioned. Um... So I think part of it is style of play. I love engine building. So if there's a faction that is about engine building and getting stuff early that has a, a long-term impact on the game, I really enjoy that. Uh, so I, I like that about the Chaos Magicians. Um, Skylar's other question was also, what is your process to create character storylines in my own games? Uh, sometimes it's up to the world builder. Sometimes I am not the world builder for our games, like in Scythe. Um, Jakob's the world builder for that. Um, in Charterstone, I was the world, world builder, along with Mr. Cuttington. They helped out. Uh, uh, quite a bit, but uh, I kind of just, uh, you know, I kind of just go with a few different ideas. Like I, sometimes I start with, a, like I started, I think maybe with the colors in Charterstone, I picked six different colors and then I applied resources to them. And then I, those resources help me tell a little bit of a story uh, about those different characters. Uh, so I, I think it really depends on, um, on, on how I'm designing that particular game or if I even am the world builder. Kathy says, any update on when Wingspan will be available on iOS? Uh, I have no idea, Kathy. I'm sorry. That's, that's a question for Monster Couch, the, the digital developer for, uh, for Wingspan. Lewis says, are prototypes one-off game component print runs expensive? Uh, if someone like myself wanted custom-made expansions for games, is it even possible for an enthusiastic gamer? For example, I love the idea of proposing to my partner through a custom expansion to one of your games. Could this be a reality for people, or is that a huge outlay and time for a developer? Uh, so definitely, if you're making like one copy of something, it can be very expensive. But if you're using it to propose, uh, you know, go for it. Make it and have the game crafter make one copy of it. However, look up here. I'll try to find an article about uh, from Stomar Games. Three weddings, or I'll look at weddings. So we have had a number of people propose using components in our games. And we now, as you can find on a link on this page, we offer card templates that you can use to create like a proposal card. I just posted it down below. Let's see if I can find the original question here. Yeah, so Lewis, if you look at the, 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 the link that I just posted below, you can use the templates that I share there if you want to create a custom card. And I recommend going through print and play productions they will require you to make a whole card sheet of one of those cards. But again, it's well worth it if you're doing something big like proposing. And so you can make a card like in the Scythe world, a Scythe encounter card where um, your fiance will, will draw that card and, and have the proposal on that card itself. So it's not a whole expansion, but you can do it with a single card in one of our games um, using that, that template that we offer. Bradley says, do I ever change a mechanism or aspect of a game because it is too similar to another published game? I, I would say, yeah, I mean, on an ongoing basis, because I learned so much from other games. I love the mechanisms in other games, but I don't want to do the exact same thing in any of my games. So, uh, yeah, if I, if I have a mechanism and I realize, oh, that exact same thing is in another game, I might tweak it a little bit so it's just unique and a, a little innovative in, in the game that I'm publishing or designing. But sometimes, I mean, sometimes the exact mechanism can just be the best fit. It can be what's most fun for the game. As long as it's not like the entire mechanism of the game, I, I don't want to ever copy another game's mechanism. I want to learn from it, but not uh, not copy it. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. How big of an impact does that mechanism have on the game? Rolling with Rock says that he, AJ, this is AJ, says, I just filmed an unboxing of Pendulum and Between Two Castles of Medkin Ludwig, and I'm looking forward to reviewing them both. Awesome. Thanks for doing that. 
Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. Uh, George mentioned that Panda Manufacturing had a symposium last week called Pandemonium. Stillmeyer Games were given as an example for a high-quality, state-of-the-art component manufacturing. Yeah, we have pushed pandas to make some things that they never made before, and they did a great job with them, like the sticker cards in, in Charterstone. Justin says, have I heard of League of Legends or any MOBA video games? I have. Yeah, I haven't played them, but I have heard of them. Curious if you think the MOBA genre is something that could be implemented well in board gaming. You know, Justin, I think it has by a few different games, and I don't know if they've been super successful. Um, there is a game from Kulminir Not or Simon, that has, it's a pirate game that, that uses that MOBA format. And I've seen a few other games. I think if you Google like MOBA style tabletop games, you'll see a few of them. A few of them have done well on Kickstarter. I think maybe more related to the miniatures than the gameplay itself. I, I haven't heard much about them ever since the Kickstarter. I don't know what, why that is, uh, why, why that format doesn't translate as well, given its success on like League of Legends, it doesn't translate as well to the tabletop. Uh, Josh says, check out Cloudspire. Apparently Cloudspire uses something like that. And Cloudspire has done pretty well, I think. Uh, Skytear. I've heard great things about Skytear from, from Covenant, uh, from the Covenant cast. Victoria says, it would be great to have a card pack for charity on Wingspan that has endangered or even extinct birds. Just a small pack. Victoria, yeah, we actually did a poll last week on the Wingspan group about what type of promo pack people would most like to see in the future. And the two of the top picks were extinct birds and endangered birds. And for endangered birds, while there are some already in the game, if we did that, I totally agree that that uh, a percentage of that, it would be great if we went towards um, nonprofit or organizations that are helping to prevent those birds from actually going extinct. Totally agree with that. Yeah. Juso says, uh, which non Stillmeyer game feels to you like you could have designed it? Uh, I don't know if it feels like something I could have designed, but if it feels like a Stillmeyer game or a Jamie Stegmeyer game, I do have a video about that. Um, about I think the title of it is like games that we would have published or that we could have published. I don't know if I can find it real quickly here, but let's see if I can find it. Um, some of the games on that list were Ra, I believe was on that Ra, on that list. Um, so it has to scale up to five players. So that's a core thing of a Stillmeyer game. Uh, let's see if I can find this video. Yeah, okay, top 10 games by others that we would have published. And on the screen cap, I show Quacks. Quacks doesn't play up to five out of the core box. Lords of Waterdeep. And I believe that other photo is of Ra. But I'll post a link to that in, uh, in the chat below so you can check out that video. Couple more questions here and I'll wrap up for the day. Thank you so much for, for joining me for this, this chat today. Lots of great questions. Okay, I gotta scroll back up to find, okay, here we go. Carol says, uh, how did your champion experiment go earlier this week? I think it went well, Carol, but we won't really know because most of the experiment was focused around um, the FedEx home option for people at checkout. So we will, I actually need to look at how many people even used the FedEx home option and we need to see logistically how it actually goes over the course of this week as the, those orders are being shipped. So I don't know quite quite know yet. Um, I don't quite know yet, Carol, but I'll let you know. Jeremy mentioned uh, TI4 as a new edition of a game. Miles mentioned Downforce, but yeah, I should, I love Downforce. I have just all restoration games here noted on my little, little note here of new editions of games or new versions of older games. And Tim does clarify that Mysterium Park is a, a sequel game to Mysterium. He says it's set in the 1950s U.S. with a dark carnival. It takes out one of the rounds, so you are only looking for the murder suspect and location. No DM screen, just a codenames type card game with colors on it so the ghost knows who has which cards each round. It takes about 28 minutes. Cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I'd love to, I, I love Mysterium, so I'd love to check out another game in that genre. Joseph says, how would I put these in order based on their manufacturing costs? Uh, he, he lists cards, cardboard tokens, plastic components, wooden components. Uh, highest cost, well, if they're plastic miniatures, plastic, so plastic miniatures, and then wooden components, and then cardboard tokens, and then cards. Um, if they're uh, plastic, if they're like plastic meeples compared to wooden meeples, they're the same, and then cardboard tokens, and then cards. Tim linked to Broken Meeple's review on Mysterium Park. Awesome. Thanks for doing that, Tim. 
Rafal says, how does your working day look like and how long do you work every day? Um, I usually get up around 7 or 7.30 and start working right away. Um, I take a brief break to work out and shower. Um, and, but other than that, I work through until around 11.30, 12, take a half hour lunch break. And then I work through to typically around 6 o'clock and then take a dinner break and then usually work for maybe another hour, hour and a half, uh, typically at creative stuff at night. A full breakdown will be quite a detailed refall. Usually in the morning I'm doing email um, and content creation, uh, like my, my blog videos, stuff like that. And in the afternoon, uh, if I don't have ongoing tasks to do, I have a lot of ongoing stuff to do for, for marketing, logistics, all the, all the various stuff that we do for our games, I do uh, often have some time for game development and game design in the afternoon usually maybe an hour or so. There is a blog post I have about this, about uh, a day in the work life of Jamie Stegmeier. I think you can, you can Google that under Stillmeyer Games and find it if you'd like. That has changed a little bit over time, but that's roughly still the format that I use. Uh, Marcel says, am I looking forward to Essence Spiel Digital? Are you going to participate? I am participating on uh, something that was already filmed related to Scythe Digital and Scythe in general, yeah. Hey, Jake is here, my, one of my Frisbee golf, disc golf buddies. He says he has some disc golf friends visiting St. Louis this weekend. I haven't heard, hadn't, ha, hadn't had an in-person game night since March. Would I recommend going for lighter stuff to get back into the swing of things or getting into a heavy favorite given this rare opportunity? Yeah, I mean, Jake, if I had that opportunity, I would definitely play games that, um, that I've been itching to play at higher player counts. Uh, like you, I have someone that I can play two-player games with, uh, but uh, those, those three to four to five player counts are a lot more rare. So I would go for, for the, the player count first. And then in terms of light or heavy, um, you know, I, I would do a mix of both, whatever you're excited to play. I think the one other thing I would do is I would pick games that I can't play online. So games that don't have a great board game app already or aren't on Board Game Arena, um, I, would, I would lean towards those games. And possibly maybe some games that you've been interested to get to the table for the first time. Um, you might go for that. But I also know, Jake, that you love Keyforge. So uh, playing Keyforge in person is something that you're probably itching to do. I'm curious to hear what you end up playing, though. Lewis says he loves KFC. If I worked there all day, I'd probably hate the idea of eating as I've seen it so much. How does the concept feel with you? How does this concept feel with you in gaming? I would think that consuming a product would be very different than producing a product. Um, you know, the only real burnout I've had about games at all is near the tail end of development of any of our games or products, usually I'm a little tired of it at that point. I'm still excited about it. I'm excited to get it out there to the world, but I am excited to also be done with all the nitty gritty stuff that had to be done to make that game a reality. And so it is fun for me to finally hand it off to production. Oh, looks like I may have just gotten cut off. No, I'm still here. Okay, I don't know what just happened there. Hopefully, I'm still here. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to hand it off to the publisher, to the uh, manufacturer, and just kind of be done with it for a while before it. it and then I can get re-excited about it when it's ready later. So that's really the only type of burnout that I experience, and it's for pretty much every product. It's not a judgment on any of our products. It just I work on them so closely and so long that I'm excited for them to be complete, and then I can get re-excited about them after the production is done. Uh, Eric says, okay, Eric had a question about uh, uh, French versions of, of our games. Um, he's saying that you can't order in advance like the English versions. Yes, that's true. Uh, but Matt, that could be something that Matago does a little bit better. Maybe Matago could accept pre-orders for, uh, for in, from Canada and France for, for uh, new versions of our games. I'm surprised that they don't. Uh, are you sure that they don't, Eric? Because they might, they might do pre-orders as well. I'll ask Matago about that. Okay, I have a note about that. Great notes today, guys. Thank you for, for, uh, for asking these questions. Michael says, is there any chance that you will invent or produce a game with card drafting in it? Do I have any games with card drafting? I currently don't, but I do love card drafting. I think the one barrier to entry is that initial hand just kind of being daunted uh, by something that is secret that other players can't see and trying to teach that to other players. I think that's the, the one kind of downside to drafting games. But, uh, but I do love drafting games. I think there is a decent chance in the future, Michael, that I will... Uh, design some game with some form of drafting in it yeah james says speaking of wingspan promos it would be great to get some cool art from other female artists like vanessa foley and tegan white i will have to look up those artists i'm not familiar with them james um i definitely wouldn't want to take anything away from natalia and anna because they've done such amazing things for wingspan but 
uh, maybe having uh, that maybe promo packs would be a fun way to explore some other some other artists. So I will make a note of those two people, Vanessa Foley and Tegan White. I'm sure they've done work that I've seen. I just don't recognize their names off the cuff. But thank you for mentioning them. All right. Um, looks like looks like we are. Here at the end of our chat this week, thank you so much for joining me. If you are uh, watching this on YouTube, uh, feel free to post questions in the comments below. Or if you're watching the, this on Facebook, go over to YouTube and ask questions there. That's where I can easily get notifications of questions in the future. Thanks for joining me. I will see you next week for the Wingspan Oceania pre-order and our monthly e-newsletter. Take care. Bye.